for inviting me to Mindapur College. Uh, I've never been here and I'm delighted to come to this beautiful 150-year-old college. Uh, I have recently published a book called Unseen City and it gives me great pleasure to actually present something from that book um, to this, this wonderful audience. And thank you, thank you to the audience. I see some faces I know here. And thank you everyone for coming on a rainy day um, to listen to this talk. The sociologist Nicholas Rose has argued that the interiority, that is the stocking trade of psychological systems, is best understood as a discontinuous surface, a kind of infolding of exteriority. So he says that it is an inside that's formed by the forces outside. The human being is not an immutable entity, but, a, but an entity in history, a specialized entity, uh, subjectified entity. So the argument is that the contemporary regime of the self is profoundly disquieting even in discourses where the sovereign self is negatively defined as in the psychoanalytic decentering of the ego. These ideas about the self in the human sciences have constituted the very knowledges behind what Rose calls governable subjects. So he says that even these ideas about Self, psychology, interiority have been created to make subjects governable. Despite no longer finding Marxism or psychoanalysis good to think with, Nicholas Rose gives qualified assent to psychoanalysis for its refusal to celebrate the sovereignty of the autonomous subject of self realization and their suspicion of the humanist values that come along with that sovereignty. In this talk, which is drawn from my book, Unseen City, The Psychic Lives of the Urban Poor. I study a set of variations of the Euro or America Center psi ontology of the trauma cure, asking if these can provide innovative means for post-traumatic recovery when traditional methods have failed. These involve improvisation such as intercultural dialogue, environmentalism, a commitment to the group as a social entity. Questioning the diagnostic category of trauma to read non-Western and non-military traumata may also prove to be an expedient way of revising mental health care, its disciplinary organization and governance, and its privileging of psychiatric disorder over nervous sequelae with confused etiologies. So I'll talk a little bit about my book without with all these words that seem meaningless. So I'll just read out the last time. Questioning the diagnostic category of trauma to be non-Western and non-military traumata may also prove to be an expedient way of revising mental health care, its disciplinary organization and governance, and its privileging of psychiatric disorder or the nervous sequelae with confused etiologies. The starting point of my book, Unseen City, is a historical phenomenon called free clinics. Impro improvisatory structures which try to mobilize an international mental health cooperative movement. Two months before the armistice at the 5th International Congress of Psychoanalysis in Budapest, Sigmund Freud famously declared that the poor man should have just as much right to assistance for his mind as he now has to the life-saving help offered by surgery. I have the longer quote for you to mull on. So we always think of psychoanalysis as this highly privileged, bourgeois, you know, meant for Viennese upper-class women at first and then upper-class uh, uh, persons everywhere in the developed world. Um, but you know, this is a very unique instance of a sort of mental health cooperative movement where psychoanalysis tries to get off its comfort zone, psychoanalysis tries to get into the community. Between 1918 and 1938, Freud's pronouncements on free clinics helped create a dozen health clinics from Zagreb to London, and these were free clinics literally and metaphorically, Elizabeth Dando states. They freed people of the destructive neuroses, and like the municipal schools and universities of Europe, they were free of charge. You can see on that list, I'm sorry, I'm kind of not very close to either the laptop or uh, the screen. You can see on the screen the number of free clinics that opened up, and 
you know what they were doing. And one of the key things about the free clinic is that they, they were improvisatory. So they were they were kind of set up based on the local needs of the demographic they were catering to. And the word ambulatorium is another very important word because when the people couldn't come to the clinic, the clinic went to them. You know, the people, the psychiatrists would get into vans and they would go to the and so the, it's a very it's a very sort of mobile, ad hoc, um, needs based structure that Freud designed way back in 1918. You're now seeing on the screen Ernest Jones, who was president of the British Psychological Society. He was more conservative compared to the social democratic thinking of analysts across Europe in the aftermath of World War I. His ambivalence about institutions such as the Berlin Polyclinic, you saw that name in the last, on the last slide, was related to long held beliefs about a medical foundation for effective psychoanalysis which rendered the clinical authority of non-medical and lay um, So, they, his ambivalence about institutions such as the Berlin Polyclinic was related to long-held beliefs about a medical foundation for effective psychoanalysis, which rendered the clinical authority of non-medical and lay analysts inauthentic. So Danto writes that you know he found the spread of wild analysis. As I said, it's an ad hoc structure. The big structure is an ad hoc structure, need based structure. Ernest Jones found this spread of wild analysis alarming. This changed, however, when a former patient of his, an American industrialist called Prince Hopkins, donated 2,000 pounds to set up a clinic for the purposes of rendering psychoanalytic treatment available for patients of the poorer classes. This new clinic opened on Freud's 70th birthday, May 6, 1926, at 36 Gloucester Place in London, W1. In the first 10 years, I want to talk a little bit about the British Psychological Society because you know the case studies I'm going to present are based on my work in London with Tavistock Clinic, which is very much an offshoot of this particular moment. So in the first 10 years, over 600 people were seen by either Ernest Jones or Edward Hoover. They were psychoanalytic cases, uh, analytic case states with treatment lasting between six months and four years. By 1929, all of the members of the Psychological Society were nominated as clinic assistants required to treat one patient daily at the clinic or an equivalent amount of service an imposition which met with protests and attempts at variations of duty, such as members offering financial donations in view of service. So you can see that even in the inception of the British Psychological Society, when it came to service, there was ambivalence and there was even resistance. People said, we don't want to do this, why don't we pay you the money so that you can carry out this service in the community. During the Second World War, the clinic not only continued to function, it also served as an emergency center for psychological aid. The significant milestones in the next half century, I'll just rattle this off. You may have, you may know these names, you may have heard these terms. So the free clinic became a part of the newly instituted National Health Service, NHS. So, so the UK has this kind of a social structure where everyone's entitled to health care, and that's the National Health Service. So it became part of the NHS in 1948. Wilfred Beyond, you may have heard that name, became clinic director in 1953, revising the fee structure to introduce a means-tested sliding scale of payment. What this means is people who can pay, pay, and people who can't pay, use it as a free clinic. And then there was rising despite in the 60s and 70s about the clinic's function as a training institute for students. Another important date to keep in mind, and this I'm sure is, you know, I mean, there's a lot of residents here with everywhere in the world, that when there are cuts to healthcare, mental health care is often the first to bear the brunt of it. So in 1990, NHS, National Health Service, stopped its funding of the London Clinic. In 1990, as, as late as that. So the London Clinic of Psychoanalysis, the original and Freudian free clinic in London, is no longer free. 
I had to therefore, when I was researching, you know, when, when I was researching this book, as I said, I was very fascinated by the free clinic movement, which really stands to sort of contradict a lot of things we think about psychoanalysis as being entitled, as being bourgeois. And I started in London, London clinic, but then I had to look elsewhere. And I found a multi-group based free psychotherapy program, which is a powerful model for innovative primary care mental health services. Now, speaking of NHS services that draw on psychiatric training, but are not in themselves psychoanalytical, and this, this actually marks almost all the uh, mental health interventions that are covered in my book, that they are psychoanalytically oriented, but they're not psychoanalytic, as if they don't have the same requirements for time, they don't have the same duration for the session, they don't even always require psychoanalysts, you know. Um, Penelope Crick quotes Freud's 1919 statement about adapting therapy for large-scale applications, which he said would, and there's a beautiful sentence, compel us to alloy the pure gold of analysis freely with the copper of direct suggestion. And as we know, alloys are often stronger than pure metals. It's a very interesting analogy that Freud makes. And this is often cited in scholarship to justify the transition from strict psychoanalysis to more adaptable forms of psychotherapy. And you know, in the rest of the talk, I will be talking about more adaptable forms of psychotherapy. I just want to check, people are still hearing me and seeing me and you're with me? Yes? Good. So during my research for Unseen City, I collaborated for three years with the Tavistock Trust. Now if you're in the UK, if you're thinking of becoming a psychoanalyst in the UK, this is a, this is a name which is very powerful because it's a not-for-profit public benefit corporation, which provides over half of the NHS, if you remember that the National Health Service, it provides half of the NHS mental health provision. That means it provides, it provides free mental health provision and it provides about 50% of NHS mental health provision. The initiative of Tavistock I worked with is called PCPCS, the City and Hackney Primary Care Psychotherapy Consultation Service an innovative free mental health service provided by the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust. The PCPCS team based in, I'll show you the slide. So that's the, the, the sculpture of Freud that's just outside the Tavistock. It's not very far from the place where Freud breathed his last in Maresfield Garden. That's now the Freud Museum where I was very fortunate to have my book launch for Unseen City. That's, that's in, um, in Hampstead in London, and it's very close to both the Tavistock Clinic and uh, Mansfield Gardens, where Freud breathed his last, where Freud spent his last few years. So uh, the PCPCS team, based in St. Leonard's Hospital in Hackney, supports general practitioners, they are called GPs in the UK, throughout the London boroughs of City and Hackney in the management of patients with complex needs. Now, complex needs is another important word to keep in mind. It often means that the GPs can't make head or tail of the mental health needs people are coming to their doors with. So, one of the complex needs is called MUS, Medically Unexplained Symptoms. And this is something, if you are at all familiar with Freud's early case studies on hysteria, you know that this is what Freud would have called them if he had the term, because Dora, for instance, comes to Freud with, with aphonia. She feels that there's something in her throat, but pathologically, there's nothing wrong with her throat. Medically, people can't really find any uh, sort of reasons why she has aphonia, she has a nervous cough, why she can't eat. So this is medically unexplained symptoms. People are suffering, people are feeling debilitated by certain symptoms, but doctors can't you know, make head or tail about what that is about. So these are called MUS or medically unexplained symptoms. Now, the people I worked with, the PCPCS team at the St. Leonard's Hospital, they call these medically unexplained symptoms medically untold stories or medically untold symptoms. And so these are, these are sort of you know, personality disorders, PTSD associated with childhood abuse, chronic or severe mental illness. Because of the complexity, the needs of the patient supported by PCPCS do not map onto existing structures of service provision, cite Michael Parsonage at all. Historically, patients in this category, so this category of medically unexplained symptoms, 
have also tended to revisit the mental health, uh, resist the mental health rubric because of social and cultural stigma. So it's not very nice to keep going to the GP and the GP telling you, nothing's wrong with you, go back, go back, get back to work. So they, after a while they stop coming. In reality, they remain within primary care for treatment as long as they are able. The intractability of their problem is causing vexation to GPs and other practice staff. So PCPCS, you know, uh, I'm not going to be able to sort of like say the full form again and again, but I'll say it one more time. So primary care psychotherapy consultation service. This is again an initiative of the Tavistock in Hackney, in St. Leonard's Hospital. So the PCPCS was set up to support local GPs in the treatment of these complex needs, which are also chronic needs, because obviously if they're not being resolved, then uh, they also don't go away, they become chronic. The service has two main functions, the second eclipsing the first over the years, improving the dynamic between the GP and the patient, and offering individual treatments in the form of brief psychotherapy or psychological therapy, which lasts between four to 16 weeks, so very short duration, but something better than nothing, depending on need and by agreement with patient as well as the primary caregivers. So this PCPCS is run by a multidisciplinary team of professionals from psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy, nursing, and of course social work. Julian Stern, the head of psychiatry at the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust, points out that medical psychotherapy in the NHS has been... You can look at the slide of the PCPCS model. Um, it's quite unique because as I said, you know, I mean, the Tavistock Trust, you know, it is a special unit in St. Leonard's Hospital. And Julian Stern points out, she's the head of the Tavistock, she points out that medical psychotherapy in the NHS has been predominantly psychoanalytic in orientation. Until a little over a decade ago, almost all consultant psychiatrists in psychotherapy were trained in psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So what I'm saying is that you know, the initiatives that followed, including the one I talked about, this horticultural therapy, they're not exactly strictly psychoanalytical, but the people who deliver the service are all trained in psychoanalysis. So this is a key part of my book, looking at adapted psychoanalysis for the poor, adapted psychoanalysis in the community, adapted psychoanalysis in an international frame. And, and, and so it's very interesting that Stern points out that they're actually almost everyone who's providing this adapted psychotherapy is actually trained in classical psychoanalysis. Psychotherapy in the public sector in the UK has been influenced by European psychoanalysis as well as, as, well as US and Russia led behaviorism. With the rise of CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy and briefer forms of therapy designed to lend themselves to supposedly scientific modes of assessing clinical effectiveness, psychotherapy departments with a more psychodynamic focus have been under substantial threat. So I don't know if you know about CBT, but this is much more, it's called EBM, evidence-based medicine, where a certain therapeutic model which promises results. So come to us for three, four weeks, we'll give you certain exercises and you're good to go. So this has actually kind of been very wrongful for, in a way, the talk therapies, which are not so product oriented, which actually try to get to the problem of bottom of the problem, not just cure the symptoms. So you know the, um, so yeah, psychotherapy departments with the more psychi psychodynamic focus have been under substantial threat, closing down or forced to gravitate to free and manualized forms of therapy with a limited number of sessions. So Stern points out that while psychoanalysis has continued to flourish in the UK, and while psychotherapists in the public sector have psychoanalytic training, the profession itself has valorized individual work. So again, uh, psychoanalysis as individual, intense, analytic work, not giving back to the community. You know, so kind of even in, uh, even in the UK, which has this socialist healthcare structure, the National Health, Health Services, even their psychoanalysis privileges individual intense analytic work, private practice in other words, and not giving back to the community. Consequently, practitioners trained in evidence-based medicine, such as CBT and briefer therapies, could be seen at the forefront of work with marginalized and impoverished groups. By the mid-1990s, CBT was the most widely and psychological therapy throughout the NHS. 
The recent scholarship by Dixring and Ruggum and Dixring and Klein, Colin et al. has not only valorized the efficacy of psychodynamic psychotherapy for complex mental disorders, but also challenged the hegemony of evidence-based medicine by demonstrating how the analytical tradition of psychoanalysis stands up to empirical interrogation. So they're kind of saying that, you know, this rise of CBT it seems to produce results, and you can again see the sort of cadences of the neoliberal society that ultimately it's not about the suffering of the poor, it's about making them capable and reinstating them to the workforce, and that's what CBT encourages. So, you know, a lot of like, researchers have pointed out that this is actually based on a lot of false assumptions that psychoanalysis itself is not scientific. And they say that no, actually psychoanalysis really does stand up to empirical interrogations. The PCPCS interventions reflect both the popularity of EBM and the concomitant resurgence of psychologically informed models. The models are varied, so they include dynamic interpersonal therapy, mentalization based therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, supportive therapy, couple work, mindfulness. And Stern points out that applied psychoanalytic and systemic uh, concepts strongly influence the service model not only in its implementation, but also in terms of its philosophical underpinnings. So Stern says that the, the services that are provided by the Tavistock are not just sort of, you know, in a way trying to adapt psychoanalysis. As I said, they do incorporate these other elements because they have to because of the funding cuts, but they still have the philosophical underpinnings of psychoanalysis. And the Tavistock Trust, the NHS Bookman and Tavistock Trust, is one of the only organizations in the UK that still offers free mental health services which have the philosophical underpinning of psychoanalysis. So my collaboration with the Tavistock led me to a horticultural psychotherapy group run by two Turkish analysts. You can look at some pictures of the garden. It's a beautiful garden called St. Mary's Garden. The participants in this group, which meets in St. Mary's Garden, Hackney, once weekly, over the four sessions of the year, uh, four seasons of the year, sorry, once weekly, four seasons of the year, they're Turkish. So these clients or these patients have experienced at least one major trauma in their lives domestic abuse, political torture, complex multiple loss severe poverty and deprivation. They are all migrants, most of them victims of trafficking, who had to endure perilous journeys to arrive at the United Kingdom 20 or 30 years ago. And this is something, I've worked with three organizations in the UK, I've worked with three organizations in the US, and this is something very common to the sort of mental disorders we see in migrant populations, that it's not often not what is happening in the present, the races, classes present, but these deep-seated traumas that are related to the migration itself, the kind of parallel journeys they have made to the US or the UK. So these, these, these patients who come to the St. Mary's Garden have no formal education. Many of them are illiterate in their own language. Most of them were menial laborers in Turkey, unable to work now because of the onset of psychosomatic presentations. Each has had to deal with intrusive scrutiny of authorities to prove their eligibility for benefits from a healthcare system organized on socialist principles. So in Hackney, I met two Turkish psychotherapists, Ahmed Kagla and Selçuk Birilgan, and they run the horticulture psychotherapy group. So Birilgan is a psychodynamic psychotherapist, and Kagla, who is also the community project group therapist, is really wonderful for my Freud Museum book launch. Kagla actually came and spoke, and it's always very thrilling to me that as an academic, as a sort of, you know, ivory tower, um, sort of, you know, um, uh, kind of really teacher and researcher, I really have been able to forge these collaborations with people, you know, who are very actively on the ground and in the sort of forefront of community mental, mental health. So Kagla, who's also a community project group therapist, is an integrative psychotherapist by training. The Turkish-speaking group is Turkish, Kurdish, or Turkish Cypriot. Hackney has a well-established Turkish and Kurdish-speaking community. The Cypriots arrived in 1913 as Commonwealth citizens, and the Turkish migrants from the mainland came to London mostly in the 1970s due to economic and political reasons. The Kurds, as you know, are state nation, and one of the most persecuted ethnic minorities of our times, 
They fled persecution in Turkey, Iran, and Iraq in the late 18s and early 90s. So Hackney is one of the top London boroughs with the largest Turkish born community. According to statistics, a community, so this is the DEMA report, it's a, it's a sort of, you know, very prestigious community based survey which is um, conducted by the Social Policy Research Center um, at Middlesex University. And according to the DEMA report, Turkish and Kurdish adults in Hackney, Haringey, or Enfield were twice as likely to be unemployed than the general population. So, you know, with, with a project like mine, Amsin City, I have had in every instance define what poverty might be. What is poverty in India is not poverty in the UK. What's poverty in, in Kolkata is not poverty in New York. So I've always had to look at these very specific instances of what it means to be resource poor. So I'm giving you a sort of insight into that uh, before I actually talk about what I did with this group. So they're twice as, twice as likely to be unemployed. Unemployment rates, social housing levels, and the proportion of those never having worked or long term, term unemployed could be twice as high as the citywide average. For Turkish born people, the employment rate was 7% against 4% of the whole population. And the proportion of income support payments is 21%, which is more than five times the national average of 4%. Of the Turkish born who were employed, the average annual income was 14,000 pounds against the national average of about 21,000 pounds you get a sense of what I mean by this uh, resource poor nature of this group. The Turkish speaking group therapist, Selçuk Berilgan, who was instrumental in designing the program initial interventions, started by liaising with the Turkish community. So this is extremely important in almost all the mental health initiatives that I have. I was speaking a few days ago with Anjali, uh, mental health NGO in Kolkata, and almost all of them, you know, they don't kind of like, they don't, they're not satellites, but they are, they have they form very formed very organic and and intricate connections with the municipal corporation services with with kind of you know in a way the community. So the psychotherapists in the Tavistock group they start with the Turkish community. They start with GPs and referrals as well as mental health professionals with experience working for this is another category like medically unexplained symptoms difficult to reach populations, almost the sense that you can't really get through to them, they're not analyzable. <coughs> the program also liaised with grow to grow a social enterprise that treated people with complex mental illness through horticulture and cooking. So this group program uses horticultural therapy to describe, to describe gardening as well as the therapeutic approach which combines talk therapy. So I'm using this term to describe gardening in the horticultural therapy describes gardening, but it's also an approach which combines the psychoanalytic talk therapy with gardening. And in what follows, I'll dis discuss the activities of this group in St. Mary's. So the pictures you're seeing are from the St. Mary's secret garden, it's called, a community space to which the group moved in 2017. They used to be in another place in London called Spittal Fields. The group at St. Mary's Garden is largely female. According to the London Poverty Profile of 2015, a majority or 80% of women of working age born in Turkey but living in London are not working. So they are not working. This is attributed to the lack of language, they don't have English, and trade skills, the lack of access to education. They also have inordinate childcare and other responsibilities in the extended family structures. And they're also, this is also related to cultural beliefs about the role of women. We are not very far, you know, from, from India here. Um, the DEMA report emphasizes that Turkish women, especially first generation immigrants, could be very vulnerable and socially isolated, as well as victimized by the patriarchal culture. They were more affected than men by family tensions that led to interpersonal violence. An interesting detail of the DEMA report was that the women, disproportionately burdened as they were with not just parenting, but what the report calls bureaucratic issues, were more likely to use welfare services and other advice services. So the women came to the psychotherapeutic services more readily than the men, despite having this kind of tremendous burden of domestic and other duties. Now, a little bit about horticultural therapy. The regeneration of the plant world lends itself very well to projects of psychic repair. As it says on the PCPCS website, the heat and toxicity of trauma are moderated. 
and the garden. The genesis of horticultural psychotherapy is often thought to be Freudian, related to a very misattributed quote, flowers have neither emotions nor conflicts, no one knows if Freud actually said this, but the illusion of having made something happen is more Winnicottian, the D.W. Winnicott in prominence. Winnicott was a pediatrician and a psychoanalyst, and he maintained that when there's a coincidence between something conjured up in a child's imagination and a real life event, it fosters a sense of self-belief, which in turn prepares us for disappointments in later life. Moreover, in his book, Through Pediatrics to Psychoanalysis, he introduced the idea of transitional space, the hyphenation between external and internal reality, which he described as a resting place for the individual, engaged in the perpetual human task of keeping inner and outer reality as separated yet interrelated. So the garden is this sort of transitional space. It is it, it's a resting place for the individual and it kind of hyphenates both the individual's inner reality and the outer reality, which are separated yet interrelated. The square foot system of gardening makes it feel manageable while so people are each given a small amount of space to cultivate, while proximity to the earth and community through shared learning provides attachment security. The therapist posits the garden as a Winnicottian third space, an intermediate area of experiencing where a gradual differentiation between subjectivity and objectivity, inside and outside, may commence. Now, you may think that what on earth is she talking about at, at a conference on death? And a large part of my book is not about physical death alone, but this category of social death that anthropologists use a lot, you know, that Judith Butler uses in Psychic Life of Power, that you are alive, but you're treated as dead, you're treated as medically unexplained, you know, and, and so this is very much the social that I'm describing, and I'm talking about pathways to reviving, regenerating, and giving life to the social dead, or the socially dead. So they, they, they inhabit this earth space, an intermediate area of experiencing, where a gradual differentiation between subjectivity and objectivity inside and outside may commence. The program, as I said, lasts for about a year for each cohort. A day's gardening once a week is followed by an hour meeting over tea in a garden shed. So I'll just show you a clip of the garden shed. So the, the room with the chairs, that's the garden shed. Um, the rules are revisited for, so this is where, so they garden all day without talking. They talk to each other, and then there's group therapy in that shed. So instead of the analytic couch, you know, we've all seen Freud's couch covered in Turkish kilims, but these are, these are kind of like, it's a slightly sort of more bare down structure, and this is for group therapy. To mobilize the group mind, it's important to maintain regularity with the timings of the meetings, including time boundaries and breaks, the therapists say. There's no formal agenda on the table, and conversation is unrehearsed, free-flowing in the best of times. They are able to say in a group what individuals wouldn't be able to say, Kagler states. Harsher divisions of religion and culture are not apparent in the group, and any of us with any idea of history know that Turks, Turks and Kurds, Turkish people and Kurds are water enemies, you know, they, though they come from the same part of the world. Um, seasonal, so you know, the, the harsher divisions of culture are not apparent, which is predicated on self-disclosure and interpersonal support. So you know, it is about group therapy, each person has to support the other. The seasonal variations aid the growth and maturation of relationships between strangers, many of whom are incapacitated by the violence of familiar relationships indoors. So they, are, they have horribly violent relationship indoors, but they come to the garden and they have the chance to make friends, have the chance to forge new affiliations. The therapists provide continuity between the sessions by recalling old discussions and integrating the same with new and different outlooks. Every six months, this produce is cooked in the shed. You can see the shed has an oven and it's feasted on. It's truly a very joyous space. You know, I've worked with this group for years, and it's just one of the one of the spaces. Despite the sort of severity and the somber nature of what's going on there, it actually really fills you with hope. The group members grow flowers and vegetables in raised beds, which are also suitable for wheelchair users. The gardening tasks, including pruning, propagating new plants, a seed saving, clearing flower beds, 
Top therapy takes place in the shed with the wood burner that can heat up to uh, 12 people. Therapy in St. Mary's Garden also involves mindfulness exercises, part of the Sacro education geared to foster embodied self-awareness in patients. If you are here, you are in the garden, you are with this group, you are with people who speak your language, you are with therapists that speak your language. And this sort of enhanced, you know, by mindfulness I mean this enhanced sense of being present. If you have any experience with people suffering trauma, that's a very key deficit that people do not feel attached to their body. They feel completely alienated from their present, completely alienated from their time, completely alienated from their from their from their mind in the in the present. Um, sorry, to restore the lost connection with their bodies, group members practice step-by-step -step skills to translate thinking to feeling and what Katla calls subjective emotional presence. They're encouraged to be aware of any positive experiences or sensations they have. Katla cites Bruce Ecker's opinion. So Bruce Ecker is the founder of something called coherence therapy, that while new learning always creates new circuits, it is only when new learning also unwires old learning that transformational change can begin. The therapists take pains to create a safe space for the participants. This, they say, is not simply a removal of threat, but it draws on unique cues in the environment, how we speak, how we look, how we listen. And I also have to be trained in this to understand this model. In the group setting, we aim to recognize the patient's autonomic state, Kagla says, and regulate and co-regulate their ventral vagal state, which is a safe, connected and social and resourceful state to work and communicate. The therapists also work, borrow from the toolkit of emotion focus and experiential psychodynamic therapy. So there's something you see a lot in community psychoanalysis that it's a grab bag of anything that works. You know, it's sort of provisional and ad hoc. So here they use accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy, they use short-term dynamic therapy. Um, so the Accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy is actually very good for working with poor populations because it works with triangles of conflict, so relationship between anxiety, defense, and feelings, triangles of person, so the relationship between the analyst, analyzant, analyzant and culture. So, you know, the analyst, the analyzant, and the Turkish culture, people from the patient's past and present. In the group setting, they are deployed in interactive ways. These modalities demonstrate how defenses work and prevent us from connecting with our feelings. So, you know, they remove these defenses to, to connect thinking with feeling. Again, the, the mode of trauma, uh, the trauma cure, is to kind of like, you know, attach the person more in the body to embody them and to embed them in their presence. Emphasizing on the experiential aspect of this mode of green therapy, Kaka says that the focus is always on the here and now rather than the there, that, then. So it's always, it's, a, it's about kind of, you know, what you're doing here. The feedback from the patients in this group, facilitated by Kaka, provides new insights into this form of ecotherapy. When asked the group, if the group helped them change the way they had hoped, the eight patients interviewed reminisce about the panoply of symptoms that had brought them to PCPCS. So the symptoms were fainting, nervous collapses, inability to get out of the house or have social interactions, neuralgic pain, separation anxiety, and debilitating codependence. So keep in mind that none of these had pathological uh, causes. Doctors couldn't realize why somebody was feeling neural neuralgic pain um, when there was nothing wrong with the tooth or the, or the brain. Um, they didn't know why they were unable to get out of bed when there was no physical debilitation. I'm much better with my emotions, patient five says. While patient seven says, I express my, myself more comfortably. It did help me. I gained self-confidence. All these are not in English, by the way. They're all spoken between the Turkish analysts and analyzants. More than half of the patients acknowledge the salutary effects of working in and as a collective. To see other people feels like family bonding, patient one states. But patient six says that the group has helped her self-sufficiency in that she no longer expects others to provide solutions for her problems. I realize that I always thought of other people in my life in order not to hurt them, but I was hurt. I started to think about my own needs. The responses to the questionnaire also reveal the ambivalence that group psychotherapy may generate. 
Patient one says it sometimes makes her feel worse, especially when she has flashbacks of the children's home where she grew up. That's what I'm saying, that with migrant psychoanalysis, it, the, the people in the community always look at not just what's happening in the, in the present, but also you know, sort of, sort of the, the baggage that come to London or New York with. Patient three complains that she couldn't express herself freely as this was a cultural group she had a few acquaintances in. For the most part, however, mutual identifications among the members provide relief for feelings of isolation and estrangement. I noticed that some people are unwell, patient eight says, while patient three says that the exposure to this group has brought the realization that compared to her fellows, my situation is better than theirs. Patient seven reveals of the group configuration that I was introverted, I opened up more. Although her pains did not ease in the course of the therapy, patient seven says that conversations in the group made me think about myself and value myself more. The group leads in relation to time-bound tasks made several patients feel they had become more organized and tidy, this word comes up again and again, in their emotion management. As patient five states, I'm now doing more things during the day. I get up, keep in mind that these are people who are unable to work. Some of them are unable to get out of bed. Most of them are unable to get out of their house. I'm now doing more things during the day. Um, I, clearly my talk is electrifying something. Um, I was all over the place before. I can cope with my pain better. Patient two compares the build, budding friendships in the group to working in the garden to grow crops. So this is very important as part of horticultural therapy, that the growth of friendship and the growth of crops, that Minnicottian idea, that it actually gives the child a sense of power when something they want actually happens. If you plant something, it actually grows into a vegetable or a flower. Growing things is very important, patient eight emphasizes, echoing patient three, who had said that the garden of produce we grow is meaningful. Patient 8, who I mentioned earlier in the questionnaire that her mind was confused, prone to forgetfulness, says, I grew vegetables, I grew vegetables for the first time, and now I grow things in my garden. The group will bring some organization to my life, like being on time. This is very telling that somebody who had fallen out of time, somebody who was not in history, somebody who was medically unexplained, is making her re-entry into historical time. To see the seeds we grow as vegetables gave me hope, says patient three, mentioning in the same breath that going out on her own once a week made her self-confidence increase. So you can see how holistic this is, working with the soil, growing plants and vegetables, but actually the most important thing is that somebody who was paralyzed, incapacitated, is actually having to get out of the bed, get out of the home. Um, patient four says, on the question and I was fearful with the idea of seeing a psychologist before. Speaking the same language was useful. Gardening made me feel I achieved something. It felt good and affected my relationship with others. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Patient six states. I think Mr. Ahmed provided a balanced group. He tries to be just and be approached, and he approached us with patience and care. The victim victimizer binary in trauma groups is diffused through the movable feast of conversation a word that comes up again and again in the case, case records. The role of the therapist, the answers on the questionnaire suggest, has been to contain the projections. Somebody says, I feel like the motherless Prince Harry. It helps chalk out action plans, and it helps work with dissociative defenses, and it helps refocus the patient on the present day, activate the isomorphic relationship between the divided self and the homogenous, yet, non-identical group. In his interviews with me, Kangla talks about a difficult patient, Eve. She had been in therapy with seven different clinicians for as many years, so seven years rattling around NHS. One of them described her as a crying baby who cannot be pacified. Eve was so irascible that she had been banned from Turkish community groups. There was a gamut of pathological symptoms, headache, dizziness, mood changes, restlessness, insomnia, depression, anxiety. He also talked constantly about her relationship troubles, her poor living conditions, her inordinate anxiety about the health of her children. She feared in particular that the mother's psychiatric history would be transmitted to her children. He had confided in Kaglar about witnessing a murder, about the, so this is on her way to the UK, about the violent tribulations of the traffic journey to the UK. And the protracted process 
process through which the, she was granted asylum. Her mother-in-law had been murdered, another relative had committed suicide. It was a big effort for E to come to the garden, Kagla says, and the transition wasn't smooth. She would mourn in Turkish or Kurdish. She refused to cook, pleading a headache, and the therapists were taken aback by the rage she seemed to incite in the otherwise docile group. E was eventually helped by the gardening project. The transitional space of the garden encouraged her to become self-reflexive and comfort traumatic memories of childhood abuse preceding the brutalizing period of being trafficked and languishing in halfway houses as an asylum seeker. Surprisingly enough, her disruptive presence had had the salutary effect of galvanizing the group, so, and they found it in their hearts, so they first came together in their dislike of E, and then they came together to actually lend a helping hand. They found it in their hearts to reach out to her. She became capable of the projective identification Freud said was crucial to maintaining psychoanalysis, capable of transference, as we call it in psychoanalytic language, and the therapists in turn were able to use this analytic tool to better treat the patient. How am I doing for time? Uh, Sakit, how am I doing for time? Just time. I'll read out another case study. The case studies are very interesting. We are, you know, we are, as literary scholars, we, we like stories, and the case studies are terribly interesting uh, because they have a beginning and an end and a sort of, sort of a, digression and a squiggle in the middle. Mrs. K is a single Kurdish woman, always well-dressed, stern, and very serious. She is referred to PCPCS as her GP felt he wasn't getting through to her. She was on a cocktail of medications and had many physical complaints. One of eight children, mostly girls, she had had a very strict upbringing and practically no formal education. Her husband, it was an arranged marriage, was very violent to her. Mrs. K was offered a course of brief therapy, psychoanalytic in orientation. The primary objective of the intervention was to help her become less self-punishing and less harshly judgmental of herself and of others. In sharp contrast to her interactions with her general practitioner, where, to his considerable vexation, she refused to talk, Mrs. K started warming to the therapy, and the therapist noticed a general softening in her demeanor. Despite this, the therapist felt that the gains, tiny shifts in her thinking, were modest, and Mrs. K was offered a place in the Turkish horticultural project that I've been talking about. She rejected this idea at first, fearful that her strict adherence to Islam was under attack due to the threat of potential contamination from big manure. An intrepid PCPCS clinician approached an imam, and after a reassurance from him that it would be fine for her to take part in the farm community, K joined the group. So this is something. I, mean, this, I, I, I note again and again in my book that these psychologists are not just staying in the confines of their chambers. They're going out to the community and they're doing everything that needs these practical, pragmatic solutions that you see a lot in India as well, that if somebody's suffering from incontinence because of a psychosocial disability, one of the first things the psychologist will say is that maybe drink a little less water when you know you don't have a toilet, you know. So I really find this very helpful because it's humanizes the analyst, it also humanizes the patient, that I know what you're going through, and I'm willing to, instead of saying you're so unenlightened, you know, you can't really, you're un un unanalyzable because you really have such sort of, you know, prejudices. Anyway, so they go to an imam, they get this sort of, um, the green light, and then she joins the group. The case records at PCPCS state that she went on to become a lively and engaged member, somebody who hasn't spoken to her GP in seven years. They sound like miracle cures, because they are. Um, she became an engaged member of the horticulture initiative, no longer plagued by symptoms, she's more physically able. Mrs. K, her GP reports, now the GP reports have significantly lessened her trips to the general practitioner surgery. Her outcome measures previously in the depressed and anxious clinical range are now in the normal range. Her mental state, the record state, is vastly improved. This is the last case study. Another case study involved a man S, age 48, who lives in a hostel in London. It's a rare case of failure, because I don't want to keep saying that everything is like people just, you know, go uh, sail into the sunset after PCPCS horticultural therapy. It's a rare case of failure in the history of PCPCS, a telling one at that. S was raised in foster homes after his mother died in his infancy. Kakla gathers from their conversations that he joined military service after emerging from foster care around age 20, but this is not very viable. S is filthy, he reeks of alcohol, and is hapless in, is hopeless in day-to-day -day interactions. He keeps saying, I'm puzzled. 
His relationship with the horticultural group is not easy, yet yes, he's very anxious about leaving the group. Kapla decides to go to his hostel to check on him when he doesn't turn up to the meetings. The room is small and petted, with no personal mementos or pictures to be seen. As talks for the first time about his hallucination, he says he sees a man by his bed. About the recurring pain from a hernia operation he had had some years ago, and the time that he had to be hospitalized after a brutal, possibly racist attack on the streets. Ahmed Kaplar arranges a caseworker, a Turkish woman, as wants to, but this does not lead to any perceivable change in his behavior. He fails to turn up to the garden as before. His physical and psychic pain is so unprocessed, Kaplar writes in the case notes, that it has impacted his capacity to attach. The group feels like a family, as says, but the cookouts remind him of his wretched family life. He's in foster care, so the wretched family is not a happy one for him. So it, it reminds him of his wretched institutional and life and life in foster care. As is too fragile, tormented by the fact that he was never adopted out of foster care. So what happens with children in the UK at least is that they, are, they go from family to family and then somebody, one of the foster families, actually goes ahead and adopts them. But when they're not adopted, you know, the sense of abandonment is, you know, double, if you will. Um, this, and he suffers belatedly from the discontinuities of a life that he lacks the psychic resources to remember, let alone re-articulate. We can't do anything for him, Kedla states, because he's not doing anything for himself. S leaves group therapy shortly afterwards. He's technically an MUS, medically unexplained symptoms. Kedla says, yet look, nothing is, ex everything is explicable, nothing is inexplicable. The back pain, the lack of post op aftercare, the world's withholding of love or care for S. Find a bit of my talk. Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps Score argues that trauma produces actual physiological changes. So, not just psychological changes, but physiological changes, including a recalibration of the brain's alarm system, an increase in stress hormone activity, and alterations in the system that filters relevant information from irrelevant. So it's a very non-dualist interpretation which doesn't see mind and body as separate entities, which I have argued that in the PCPC and gardening techniques, they're constantly through mindfulness bringing mind and body together. So the traumatized state is redefined as both a psychoneurosis and a physioneurosis, where the changes in the brain compromise the embodied feeling of being alive. So the advantage of this is that the brain can be treated better to heal the body. It's neuroplasticity utilized to make survivors feel more alive, more in control of the present. Bessel van der Kolk, one of the world's foremost experts on traumatic stress, suggests three distinct pathways of trauma cure, talking and reconnecting, taking medications that shut down hyperactive alarm systems, and finally, allowing the body to have experiences that viscerally contradict the immobilization and powerlessness associated with trauma. At the therapeutic nursery of St. Mary's Garden, the third most recuperative stage is associated with the fostering of an environmental imaginary and patterns of belonging to one's body and story that enables a re-inhabitation in the local and national. The group participants have almost no insight into possible links between their physical symptoms and early emotional traumas and causes. In order to address this traumatic association, the gardening therapy includes psychic education about the body in the form of grounding exercises and mindfulness. It sensitively addresses the self-stigmatization of patients suffer from the gay concerns, related to the internalization of prejudice, hopelessness, and the debilitating lack of confidence. One of the major tasks, as I said, you know, they are they experience social death. They are the 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 basis of the the violence is when I'm feeling the nature of the family is so extreme that they, are, they suffer from extremes of self stigmatization One of the major tasks of the group work is to reverse their pattern and to try to build resilience and capacity in that one space. This is between primarily the students in the environment, training the members in particular on violent communication and constructive criticism. Kagwa mentions the Turkish word Sobolet. And the conversation between therapist 
their children and marry them, set them kids with seeds and compost, continue gardening in their small plants or grasses. Thank you very much.